and welcome to our show, Welcome to, uh, welcome to SCAN. I'm Pat Bowes, the Executive Director of SCAN, which stands for Social Community Activities Network. SCAN provides active adults exciting social activities, information and referral services, and we are in the business of keeping one's minds and bodies engaged, healthy, and um, making sure that our later years are the best years in the, of our lives. Today, is, I, we have our guest today. I'm really excited about having our, uh, our guest today. Um, so Dr. Martin Michael Lesky, who is a um, surgeon, which we're going to find his specialty and what he does. But we're going to be talking about pelvic floor disorders. And I must share with you, when I first heard of the topic, it was um, a little foreign to me because while it's so common and such a major issue, um, I don't think we talk about it at all, if, if at enough. So I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you. Thank you. I would love for you to take a couple of minutes and tell us how you come to our table today in regards to your background and your specialty, and then we can take it from there. Okay. Thank you for having me here, and good afternoon, everybody. Now, female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, which is a new name of formerly known as urogynecology. It's a specialty or subspecialty of uh, OBGYN that combines gynecology and urology. The reason or need for the specialty arose for past 20 years where um, sur surgeries or any condition in the female pelvis when you have reproductive organs and urinary system were treated by two specialists. One was urologist and one was gynecologist. So if they say the patient had a problem and needed some correction or surgery, those two specialists would, um, let's say, uh, combine the treatment either at the same time or different time. Yet, the outcomes were not as one would expect because if the things were not perfect, Dr. A was sent to Dr. B, Dr. B was sent to Dr. A, and, and patient satisfaction wasn't there, obviously. Uh, we provide care anything belly button down, so to speak, in female, meaning both reproductive system and, uh, and urinary system. So, so patient receives, you know, one-stop shop care under one roof. Now, um, the specialty evolved over the past 20, 25 years, where, like I say, the need for, for, for this type of treatments and a number of patients uh, with conditions were uh, rapidly growing. In the past, primary care physician used to say to patients, uh, this is part of aging, it's, that's the way it is, you had kids, what do you expect? Well, it's not. Uh, quality of life, now it's a, it's, it's a major issue and, and we're entitled to have quality of life like we had in 20s, 30s or 40s, whether we're 50s, 60s, 70s or 80s. Uh, as we know, uh, lifespan is significantly extended now and uh, you know, when people used to live to 70s and they develop problems in 60s, they would put a pessary or some temporizing measure and say live with that. Now nobody wants to live with this. Living with, in diapers is not a it's not a optional quality of life. People want to do sports. People want to be active, and uh, and and we are we are providing the services. Now you know I, I've been doing this for over 20 years, um, uh, and uh, this, the, the, the pathway to to being a urogynecologist you can be either board certified urologist or board certified uh, obstetrician gynecologist, and then you have to take a subspecialty. Um, training and pass board uh, examination, which was introduced actually several years ago, and uh, and and we become urogynecologists, and we treat exclusively females. Uh, uh, we don't do babies. Um, uh, female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery is a broad field because it encompasses both medicine that we do medical treatments first and surgical treatments if needed. So with all of that said, and that was a really good history in regards to how, we, how it started and where it's at, your specialty is both of those. Correct. And you um, have been in this particular field for how long? I've been in medicine for over 21 years, and uh, you go gynecology uh, almost 20 years. Okay. And presently, you're, you, you um, are affiliated with um, Robert Wood Johnson, Mom, um, Bonabis, Mammoth Medical Center. Health, yes, <laughs> those names change every few years. Yep. It used to be Barnabas Health Medical System and, and combined with, with Robert Wood Johnson's, now it's called RWJ Barnabas Health. Right. And Mammoth Medical Center is primary facility where I provide care, but I also uh, go work in um, Ocean County, a community medical center as well, 
as Little West in, uh, in uh, Central State Medical Center. Wonderful. So with that established, I want to just kind of go back to the nitty gritty and the, dis and the, the conversation in regards to what are some of the p pelvic problems that a female would face or suffer from in regards to why they would come to you in regards for service? Any female who had babies knows that things down there are not the same as they used to be. And pregnancy and childbirth, natural childbirth, is probably the biggest risk factor affecting female pelvis. There's five or six major risk factors, such as, like I mentioned, A, pregnancy, childbirth, B, uh, aging, obviously, C, prior hysterectomy, uh, D, uh, being overweight, uh, E, having prior surgeries in the pelvis, radiation, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that pregnancy and childbirth is biggest risk factor, um, in medicine, there's, there's not always, always a never. So, so there are exceptions that female who had no children can suffer pe female pelvic problems as well. Uh, but majority after childbirth, when the large babies pass through the canal and some uh, deliveries can be traumatic, uh, the female pelvis re retracts to back to prior stage to some degree, but not 100%. And each consecutive delivery uh, worsens that condition, so to speak. And a young, young active people who, who exercise, who run, having pro prolapse of the bladder, the leaking of the urine, uh, rectal issues or, or pelvic pain, uh, they don't like that. Um, they live with that. They get accustomed to it. They develop coping, coping mechanisms. But, uh, but when they get the problem corrected, they always state, uh, I don't know how bad I was till it got corrected. And, and I'm a new woman now. I'm sure. And I'm sure that it's a topic that most people are uncomfortable to talk about. Yes. Unfortunately, this topic has been shied on for a while. Primary care physicians don't ask people about their female pelvic problems, the sexual dysfunction, pain with sex, bleeding, leaking. It's, it's this kind of shameful topic, asking about wearing diapers. Um, we sometimes see runners on the boardwalks here in Jersey Shore who, who have a sweaty back and sweaty pants. Those pants are not really sweaty, to tell the truth. And I have patients who say, finally, I can run because in the winter it was freezing on me. So after, after those urinary problems are corrected, people go back to their full activities. So that's really very important. And so the other piece that I, I, I don't think that you had mentioned was the um, fe fecal inc incontinence. Correct. So that's another. Correct. It's not as common as urinary incontinence, but, but it's out there. And, and we can muscle with being that for, due to hormonal changes, being that to the anatomical defect in the pelvis. Uh, you know, if we, when we evaluate patients, we always try to uh, identify, categorize, and develop a plan for action. And pelvis has different compartments. Anterior compartment, there's a bladder. Uh, upper compartment, is uterus. And posterior compartment, is rectum. Each of these compartments can have a defect. Our job is to identify what's the major defect tolerate this to the patient complain, and then establish a plan of action to, to correct the problem. Okay, because again, I think that the, the conversation around that is usually not discussed openly and readily, um, and therefore it really must affect people's quality of life, like we had said, but also their confidence. I mean, as again, as a businesswoman and a public speaker, uh, I'm sure that with something like that, I would be much more conscious about doing my job and doing it effectively to see if, if something might happen, you know, without control. So I'm sure that, um, I'm hoping that as a result of this show that people who might be experiencing some of these particular disorders that they would pay attention to it a little more and understand that it's, it's pretty common versus not. Yes, it's common and, and it's more and more prevalent as, like I say, as our baby boomers population matures and we live longer and longer, there, there, there's a vast number of patients suffering from these problems. And if we look into statistics, um, one out of three females over age 45 have some type of pelvic floor dysfunction, and one out of two over age 65. So like you mentioned, the business women who run, run the various businesses who sit in the meetings and they have to think that they have to go to bathroom or not going far from here, people going shopping, know in the mall where every bathroom is because they know when they have to go, they don't have much warning and, and they have to go. And that may take focus from these business females or active females out of what they do is 
how we're going to cope with what my problem is at a given time. So they develop coping mechanisms, but they're really, really very happy when those problems are corrected. And so with that said, so what are some of the, the um, options that they have available for, for you to do in regards to correcting the, the disorders? In, in recent years, we have developed a plural, a plural of options here for treatment. And we have to say that the vast majority of those options are non-surgical. Before we even think about any surgery, we have a, between 7 to 15 different options what we can do medically. And progress in technology and medicine in the last 20 years that happened is probably larger than happened last 100 years. And we see that in example technology, talking about even cell phones or recording equipment when these uh, machines were used to the size of the suitcases and now we have the size of the watch almost. And then we can compute and power of computing and memory storage is not comparable. So same thing, that progress came to medicine. And if we talk about the progress, we have to remember that first, those fancy things, technologies come to military, NASA, then to military, and from med military to us. An example of that is surgical robot, which initially was developed for the uh, NASA, thinking that when they have an astronaut on the space station, and that person requires, say, appendectomy, to bring, send the space shuttle to the moon, or excuse me, the space station, and bring that astronaut to the Earth will cost billion dollars. So they had technicians who could put little tubes inside the patient, let's say, on the space station, and um, the tele teletechnology that surgeon Houston sitting at the console could uh, re uh, fix that appendix, say, in that case. Um, then they were thinking about using uh, those military applications uh, in the battlefield that where they don't have to fly the soldiers, say, from Iraq to, to, to Germany for surgery, but do this. Eventually, we got the robot in early 90s, or uh, actually, I should say late 90s, mid-2000s, mid 15 years ago, uh, when, when we're using these technologies. And what that helps patients is we don't open anybody. Uh, many physicians would say somebody needs to be open because their co problem is so complex that they, that they need an exploratory laparotomy. That's never the truth. The limitation is a surgical skill. So, so a skilled surgeon can do pretty much any surgery in a patient in minimally invasive fashion, being that through the vagina or little tubes, that patient goes home the same day. I would say there's a couple exceptions, such as cancer beyond the cure, or somebody being shot in the abdomen, or being in a car accident when, when cosmesis and, and quality of life don't matter, life, saving life matter. So in elective surgery and elective procedures that we offer patients nowadays, Everybody goes home the same day, and everybody's done on, on their time schedule, so to speak. So it's not invasive. Um, Absolutely. And again, do you do you use the robot um, procedure yourself? Yes, vast majority of procedures that we perform we use robotic technology, unless we you, you do the procedure uh, through the vagina, and they don't require larger surgery. We always, after evaluation, the, evaluating the patient, we give them options such as. Uh, uh, let, 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 let's, say, let's say we're going to leave the, the medical part out for a second, but that medical part is very important because, like I say, we always start with the medical part. But we're talking about technology and talking about surgery. Let's say somebody needs some surgery. We can always say the condition could be observed and see how it develops over time. Uh, that patient could have a temporizing measure such as pessary inserted, which is like a computer mouse, so to speak, inserted in the vagina that lifts up the things or tamponates them for a period of time. Or wear a diaper and, um, and, 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 and go through whatever they need to go through in the meantime. The, so, uh, Doctor, I'm going to stop you mm -hmm. right here because we're going to take a break. Sure. And then when we come back, we can get into the conversation a little more details. And hopefully, um, everyone will continue to enjoy this particular session. So, if you're over 65, like me, and active and fairly healthy, being active and healthy alone will not protect you. Remember, the immune system weakens with age. And if you're over 65, ask your doctor about your vaccination options. We want you to be healthy and active. Welcome back. Um, I'm Pat Bowes, the Executive Director of SCAN, and we are having this informative conversation with Dr. Michael Lesky in regards to pelvic floor disorders. So we have been on a roll with this conversation. I want to talk now about um, some of the 
procedures in regards to um, fixing some of the problems, how important it is to get it done right the first time versus having to fix a problem after someone else has done some surgery or other procedures. And then the last piece, I'm sorry that I'm giving you all these questions because it's, it's really important, is that does chronic disease affect pelvic floor disorders? Yes. And like I mentioned before, it's very important to properly evaluate the patient in the first place. And a part of evaluation is history and physical. I see patients who've been seen by doctors and given a recommendation, and then I examine the patient, and they have very obvious defects, so to speak, and I say, what do doctors say when they examine you? Well, they never examine me. They talk to me, but they never examine me. Look at the papers read. So there's an old saying in medicine, if everything else fails, examine the patient, okay? <laughs> and actually, we should start with examining the patient first because it's very obvious what they have. Then correlate that findings with their complaint. And medical history is very important here because there are certain conditions such as diabetes, such as autoimmune disease, uh, such as prior surgery or treatments, radiation, that affect the pelvis, the bladder, the uterus, the rectum. Having said that, diabetes affect the nerves. Nerve, nerves affect the bladder. Same thing with immune disease. Uh, inter intolerance of certain foods. Uh, patient come with pain in the bladder and we can very often apply very simple interventions that have a very big improvement, such as dietary intervention, that they eat something that has a certain dye that affects their bladder and they're going to bottom every five minutes. Elimination of that food 